G'day guys, welcome back to another Roughed Up episode. This, this is, is part two. This is part two of our two part. Go check out part one. It was really, really good episode. It's definitely a big story. Exactly. Um, this story is also massive. It's yep. about uh, Mark and him being the bodyguard for Chopper Reed. Exactly. Roger he, Rogerson. And all the stories of Chopper Reed. Uh, oh. well, it, Chopper Reed, he was only a little bit of the podcast. Yeah. There so many other people that oh. he... But thank you again, Mark, and thank you, Mal, for letting us uh, use your house for filming. Yes. It was awesome time, and um, enjoy the episode. See you guys. Welcome back to the Roughed Up Podcast. Right, so now we're just here with Mark, and you are, uh, well, as you said, You've said you were one of the highest paid bodyguards in Australia at one point. Uh, not one of the highest paid bodyguards, highest, one of the highest paid bouncers. Bouncers, yeah. Same as Mel. Yeah. Um, and another gentleman of ours that lives on the, Red, on the Red, sorry, Redcliffe <laughs> Peninsula. Yeah. Um, a good friend of ours named Mitchell O'Hello. Yeah. Um, big, tough bloke, and he has been at that stage as well. Yeah. Um, so three of us just from that, the one area have been at that level in security. Uh, Mel probably being the time that he was in it was earning the money. I was considered on good money in you know 20 years ago, yeah. but Mel was getting that in 1980. Oh yeah. The same sort of money. Yeah. Um, but some of the bouncers around Brisbane would be lucky to buy a bloody hamburger meal on the way home. Yeah. They, get, they don't get paid very That's much. Yeah. But there again, some of them aren't fucking worth that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, you. you yeah, but anyway, no, I, I was never the highest paid bodyguard um, in Australia. I, I got paid well by yeah. Chopper. Um, and uh, while I was working, apart from that, we were just, we were mates. Exactly. We lived yeah. together. Yeah. Like, he, you've got to remember, this is a man that done 23 years, nine months jail. Mm. Um, and you get out of jail after doing that, and things have changed. Mm. He didn't know how to put a DVD in a DVD player, right? <laughs> Uh, just simple little yeah. things that you take for granted every day, and I taught him a lot of things. Mm. Um, but, you know, um, American Express came along because he was making good money doing that public speaking, believe me, and that's when I was looking after him, I toured with him and, and looked yeah. after him. They gave him a credit card, an unlimited credit card. He thought it was free money. He, you do, <laughs> oh, this is amazing. You put the, a card in the machine and then... <laughs> Pull the card out, More and free. this money—it's free money. He's going, like, <laughs> fucking, like, like, and he's going, getting all excited. He goes, "This is like it works a fucking treat." He said, "Like this," and uh, anyway, um, and pay ho. He goes, "Look," he goes, "Let's go down to the hotel and get that and, and the food, the, the best steaks, please." Like this is a park royal in Brisbane. <laughs> he hands his case. He said, "This thing pays for it." And I'm looking. I'm thinking, you know, you've got to pay this back. He says, no, he said, it's, <laughs> it's free. And, uh, they're the sort of things that, you, you, you know, you, you, he couldn't, like, he was a sucker for um, lollies. He loved <laughs> lollies and chocolate thick shakes, right, yeah. from McDonald's. So anyway, you walk into a McDonald's with Chopper Reed, yeah. okay, first, people are shocked that he's yeah. there. Yeah. They see a man that's had a movie made about his life, written books, He's got no ears. no ears <laughs> and and covered in tattoos. But once you know him well, yeah. you don't the ears and the tattoos and everything you don't know, come yeah, into yeah. play. I call him Mark, not yeah. Chopper. Everyone call him Chopper. I call him Mark. Yeah. Right? Now, he just there could be twenty people in the line. He could wander up to the because <laughs> he walked funny, like and um, walk up to the counter and say, uh, the big um, uh, container there. Uh, fill that up. I want uh, chocolate milkshake with tri triple malt and um, and ice cream, and um, I'll have that and just hand over five dollars. And that he thought that would get, but they would do it, yeah. right? Anyway, by the time he gets to the back of the line, he's half eaten the bloody thing, and he walks straight back through and past everyone else. I oh, I need more chocolate and, and more malt. Here's another five dollars, and. Um, Anyway, <laughs> you've got no idea how this stirs people up. Like, yeah. And I'm saying, mate, you're going to get me head punched in here one day doing this sort of thing. You can't do this. He said, you, you're paid to look after me. I'll do what I want. I said, oh, fair enough. Anyway, 
the young kid, at, this actually happened at the McDonald's at the BP northbound there. And the young kid that served him thought, oh, this is wonderful. I've served Chopper Reed. Come running out to the car park. And he said to Chopper, he had a napkin and a pen. He said, can I please have your autograph? And Chopper said, fuck off. <laughs> like this. And I said, Mark, I said, don't be so fucking rude. I said, that's rude. That kid helps you out. He went out. He's only a kid and you've told him to fuck off. He All he wanted was an autograph. I said, I called him back to the kid. I said, here, mate. I got him a baseball bat out of the car. It was all pre-signed. I said, here you go. I said, now, Mark, stand there. I gave the kid, I said, get a photo. And I took a photo for the kid with his phone and the baseball bat with Chopper. Yeah. And then he ran off. They're all excited. Years later, I was at a party somewhere, uh, I don't know, I was at a party and this young kid, he came up he said, do you remember me? And I said no. <laughs> and uh, he said, you made Chopper give me a baseball bat and um, <laughs> I served him at McDonald's and I said ah, I remember, it was years later yeah. and I thought, I said, you still got it? He said, yeah, hang it on the wall. He said, oh, well, I wouldn't have it for you, except for you. And he put his hand out and shook my hand. Yeah, there. Wow. And um, so if if we were so obviously chopper you tro chopper is your big story obviously yeah, but yeah. you've also had other people that you you've looked after and we'll go through like i guess uh, how did you was chopper the first person that you looked after um you know what i forget um uh, first real, oh no, no, full-time uh, bodyguard, like as his full-time bodyguard, yes, but I'd done work for musicians and that in, in as far back, I think, 93, I think it was the Razor's Edge tour, and I was um, involved with the security for ACDC when they were here yeah. then. Um, and I can't remember the year, it was uh, um, I did security for Elton John. Wow. Um, but um, as a full-time bodyguard, someone that was fairly serious into it, um, yeah, Chopper. Yeah. And um, along that period with Chopper, I became involved with uh, the no notorious, well, they call him disgraced, I think he's a hero, Roger Rogerson. A lot yeah. of people know him. Yeah. He's had two movies made about his life, yeah. Roger Rogerson. And to know Roger the way I knew him, it, listen, he's an absolute gentleman. Um, and yeah, sure, he shot and killed people. Yeah. We're in the line of duty, I think he's the only cop to have shot three people dead in the line of duty in the history of Australia. Yeah. Um, but they were shitbags, mate. They deserved it. Hang on. Are we Roger Rogerson? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, mate, if he was sitting here now, mm. you'd just think he's a grand old grandfather. Yeah. And uh, unless I told you who he was, you yeah. would not know that the man... He had, this is a guy who was the most decorated police officer in Australian history. Yeah. He, he, he had 13 bravery awards. Like, the, the amount of bravery the man showed and everything, and he, he virtually ran Sydney. He cleaned up Sydney, mate. If, if someone got out of line, he'd shoot him. No problem at all, mate. Yeah. No problem at all. And for him, and like, we went on, I was his bodyguard um, when he needed it. Uh, we also did a fair bit of debt collecting together. Yeah. Now, when we went dick collecting, um, I didn't really have to do anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. His name alone just w w like, scared yeah. people that much that they would just hand, hand over what they do, yeah, what they yeah. yeah. And um, anyway, um, for him to get caught at the age of look, next year it's ten years. He was seventy-four when he got pinched on that murder. Yeah. He was at our gym in Redcliffe. We were having an uh, inter-club inter tournament there. He was a special guest. Yep. Right, I brought him up. And earlier that week, um, well, they've put him in jail for murder. So on the Tuesday, they claimed that he shot a um, Chinese yeah. fellow with another copper in, yeah. in a storage shed. Mate, we had no idea. That's mm. how, how cold he can be. If he wants to be cold, he can be very, very cold. Yeah. Yeah. But to us, he's a warm guy with had charisma in his eye and, and was very, very nice. Yeah. Um, so nice that you can't tell that he's shot a bloke. So, uh, so he like kind of hid that life from other people? Like Yeah, yeah uh, well, in a, in a, yeah, I know a lot of his secrets, so I won't talk yeah, about them. Yeah. But um, that week, and we never had any idea, mate. He never let on to any of us. And there was a lot of us um, that something had gone down that week. Mm. Um, and then um, 
he received where it was the Sunday night. We were back at Bunga's house under, at the time we had Bunga's Tree of Knowledge. It was a big tree in the yard and all sat under that. And about seven o'clock at night come and Roger got a phone call from his wife saying that they're raiding the house. Mm -hmm. His house, he just went all quiet for about a minute. Then he just kept drinking. Anyway, I'm thinking, oh, oh well, oh. <laughs> something's going on. Um, I went home just up the road to my place. Next thing, I turn on the TV in the morning and uh, we're looking for Roger Rogerson. Uh, the police are looking for Roger Rogerson on a murder charge. Oh, yeah, wow. And um, I'm going, what? Yeah. Just at that moment, my uncle rings me and says, hey, Roger has shot through in the middle of the night. And Bunger gets up pretty early. Roger had gone because he was staying at Bunger's house. Yeah. Taken off. And um, anyway, he'd, um, what he'd done has gone from our place to a mate of his uh, at Surface Paradise, hid in a unit there overnight and then drove to Sydney in the middle of the night wow. to get himself back. Yeah. And uh, he rung me um, just before he got back home and he said, oh, I think they're going to charge me, mate. And I said, well, I'm standing out the front of my gym and there's about four undercover police cars there that, yeah. and I've approached them all and they all keep driving away. He said, yeah, they're coppers. And uh, I said, a couple of them have just pulled up now and one is a gigantic bastard. <laughs> and he's looking, anyway, I hung up. That was the last I heard from him. And the copper, big copper, mate, like he was about six foot six. And I was looking up, he said, Mark? I said, yes. He goes, where's Roger? I said, I don't know. He's gone. And he goes, where's Bunger? I said, down the back in the boxing ring down there. That's him there. And he went, Bunger, like this. <laughs> Bunga had to hop in the police car, go back to Bunga's house. Yeah. They had the house completely surrounded, not with just normal police, not not blue shirt police. They were fully decked out with the bloody FBI body FBI armor FBI. and the, yeah. everything. Bunga said, "Go for your life. He's gone." Mm. Yeah. And uh, anyway, then they brought Bunga back down to the gym, and. Uh, yeah, then they've got him on murder, put him in there for life, which is sad. Um, at 74 years of age, I, I can't, I can't understand why he has done anything like that at, at that age. And on video, he, like, how could you not know that the fucking video cameras are everywhere? Yeah, that's, that's, and um, yeah. anyway, the actual car that they put that what well, was pulled up in front of the thing you might have seen it on the TV, that silver one. I've driven that car. I've been in it a fair, fair few times. Yeah, and. Um, Anyway, there for life, he's got two daughters that are uh, in their 50s and got grandkids. He'd never see them again. Yeah, that's, that's really sad. You know, I, I think now, you know, they should really let him out, but they won't let him out because he's got so much dirt on people. Mm. Um, go, I'm talking from crooks to high-ranking police officers to the top, mate, yeah. prime ministers. Yeah. And believe me, he wields, he, he yields a lot of power. He, he really does. Uh, and uh, I was actually driving along with him one day and I said to him, I said, if Chopper said he was gonna kill me, I'd laugh. <laughs> I'd laugh at him. I was yeah. feeding him wood. Yeah. I said, but Roger, if you said you were gonna kill me, I said, be on, I'd be on the next plane out of the country. He said, don't take too long to fucking pack, son. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, I'm far more scared of him. I, Chopper, I, I wouldn't scared of him at all, mate. But Roger, yeah. 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 Well, we'll get into your chopper story first. I just thought the uh, removal of toes with a bolt cutter was rather humane. As I said to a mate of mine, Linus Patrick Driscoll, who was head of a group called the Toe Cutters in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, I thought that uh, cutting people's toes off with a bolt cutter was rather puffy. Oh, you know, I, you know, I thought it was rather effeminate. Why is that? Oh, like a blowtorch, you know? The smell of burning flesh in the air. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, mm -hmm. and I've, I've done some research that you originally met Chopper before you started actually working for him with, uh, you're working with Mad Charlie? That, that's not quite correct. Not quite correct? No, Mad Charlie, no. Um, Chopper told me to put that in a book, that <laughs> part. No, I've <laughs> never met, never met Mad Charlie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, the, um, no, I met Chopper, mate, um, when he started doing his, uh, Pub X, yep. and uh, straight off the bat, um, mainly because I went straight up to him and shook him, shook his hand. Yep. Say, how you going? I'm looking after the security here. Yep. <laughs> anyway, later on that night, he said to me, "You're my full-time bodyguard." <laughs> That's basically it. Yeah. yeah. Didn't he? Didn't he say like I, I've read as well um, that 
you're the best bodyguard that they've ever shoveled guts into or something he said or <laughs> someone along uh, those lines I don't know how uh, <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't rate myself as uh, the best body he, he, he used to write uh, the best bodyguard God ever shoveled guts into <laughs> Yeah. Probably, um, it's a quirky saying, that's why he would be saying that, but there was, uh, I was really surprised to see on the internet at one stage, they, they had these ratings of bodyguards and stuff. Oh, okay. Now, it was from one to ten, right? One of them was ranked ten. Okay. And I thought, huh, I wonder how I got there. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe I deserve that yeah. at all. Um, you've got blokes that have taken bullets for the president of yeah. the United States and other things, very brave acts and stuff like that. Here, here I am, a kid that went to a little school and uh, was bullied, and uh, all of a sudden I'm in these ratings as a bodyguard. I don't believe I deserve to be on them. Mm. Um, and the other one, I was ranked number three. <laughs> and I thought, shit. I thought, I wonder how they Don't even the categorise categories this. Like, how do they <laughs> evaluate this? They've never even met me. Yeah. Now, the bloke that was number two, right, in that, that ratings, was the bloke that took a bullet for President Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and I thought, I haven't done any act, quite act of bravery, not even close to that. <laughs> oh, I don't deserve to be there. I was quite embarrassed by yeah. it. And uh, I, th I just sat there thinking about this. I said, this, they haven't really put no thought into this whatsoever. Yeah. A lot better bodyguards than me around, trust me. Yeah. A lot better bodyguards than me. If I was a, a, a bloody world-beating bodyguard, mate, I'd be bloody Donald Trump's bodyguard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, he, Chopper did say that, but it was really, it, it was a quirky line he came up with and he just said it a lot. And uh, it's written everywhere, yeah. you know. Well, well the... Supposedly, the night that you met him on that night that he was at the pub doing his tour, you got a hammer, hammer hit into that was you. That was a different night. Different night? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, different um, night. Yeah. And obviously that's an act of... Oh, I, I think it was an act of fucking stupidity. <laughs> um, yeah, um, anyway, oh, I suppose, yeah, you could say it's partially braveness. Mm. Um, you get hit with a hammer, I wouldn't want to do it again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you were saying before, before we started recording, it's more of a mental, like a, the, the bodyguard job is more of a mental thing. Body, bodyguarding is 99% mental and psychological and 1% physical. Yeah. Bouncing, um, it can be the same if you use your brain. Yeah. Right? Now, a lot of the time it is physical though, but if you use your brain, like just say, if, once you've allowed someone in the bar, just say this is the bar mm. here, once you've allowed them in and you ask them to leave, you've got to make the first move to make them leave, right? Mm. You, you've got to have that interaction, grab them. If you can't talk them out, you've got to grab them and throw them out. And these days you get in trouble for it. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's the door to the pub over there. I'm standing at the door and I'm saying, no, you can't come in. Well, they have to interact first and make the move to get past you, yeah. which puts them in trouble, right? Yeah. So if you use your brain... You with make it, them yeah, do something. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you can get away with a lot. Mm. It's just these days, it's a lot different. There's fucking video cameras everywhere. Everyone's got a camera on their phone. They're yeah, all filming you. security wear cameras now. Like, yeah, you have to, it's changed a lot. When Mel was doing it, it changed a lot to when I was doing it. Mm. it um, there was no video cameras then. Mm. They had VHS ones when I was bouncing. I used to get the tape and throw it in the fucking river <laughs> and put in a new tape so it wasn't recording. Yeah. And the coppers, they, they couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. And uh, I, I used to know how to get away with a lot. I, yeah. I was very good at it. Um, and uh, But these days, if I reckon that if me and Mel went and stood on the door at, say, Eaton's Hill Pub mm. or something like that, I reckon uh, first night charged and probably in jail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, so yeah, it's a it's a different game these days, and yeah. it and you're dealing with blokes that won't just stand there and stand up and have a knuckle, a fair income knuckle fight. Yeah. You're dealing with someone that'll knives. yeah, well, have a knife and Stanley knives are the worst thing. You can buy a Stanley knife at the Kmart down the road or whatever, and they a Stanley knife will kill you in a second. Like yeah. if all they have to do is flick you like that yeah. with it across the femoral artery, mate, you're gone. Yeah, yeah. and um, there's people around that will do that. You yeah. know, and um, well, lately there was that 
guy at the uh, Fortitude Valley Station, and yeah. I'm pretty sure he had a box cutter or something, just a cross yeah. neck. Oh, they jabbed him in the neck down yeah, there, yeah. which is possibly yeah. the worst way. Cause it's cut along the vein, yeah. and he wouldn't even have known, mate, yeah, what happened. Yeah. He just went like that, then he fell over, he yeah. bled out. Yeah. That's mate, that, that's how dangerous it is, and you've got less power now. So you can't you can't just do what we did. Like my, I was taught by blokes that would now be Mel's age mm. when I first started bouncing, and they said to me, Mark, this is how you do it. You walk up to them at the bar, you ask them to leave nicely. If they don't leave, punch them straight in the fucking mouth. <laughs> yeah. And that's how it was done. Yeah. And uh, you had to create fear and create a reputation. Yeah. Once you created that fear and that people feared you and they had that respect, you hardly got any trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Now you cannot create a reputation yeah. like yeah. that. Where, where did you start off, like, start off? Bouncing, like what location was it in Sydney or? No, no, Brisbane, um, Brisbane? Rogues Nightclub, Underwood, Brisbane. Yeah. Um, no longer there. It's a it's a pet barn there. Pet barn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bit yeah. of a change. Um, but you had to um, back then, you had to prove your worth as a bouncer um, to get into that place. I had to work four weekends for free. Oh, wow. To get in because you. Now, you can just pick and choose where you want to work because there's a shortage of security yeah, yeah. and um, no one wants to do it. It's a shit of a job. Yeah. Back then, you had to earn your medal, like you had to prove yourself. Anyway, I was working with blokes that were big, tough blokes and um, I was a kid, mm. remember? And you used to have to be, the rule was 100 kilo to work there. Yeah. You had to be six foot and 100 kilo. Well, I was six foot and 70 kilo. Yeah. So to get a start there, I, I, I did pretty well, mate, to yeah, get in there, yeah. believe me. Yourself. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, I did that, and it uh, went on from there. Well, um, back to the whole chopper thing. Yeah. Um, with the with the with the hammer night where you got struck by the hammer. How yeah. did that go down? Was that a big? Mate, it, 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 no, hardly anyone's seen it. Um, it was in the dark car park um, of a hotel. Oh, I can say the name of it now, the Acacia Ridge Hotel, mm -hmm. um, out the back there, and uh, it's a very very big hotel, mm -hmm. and. Uh, this bloke wanted um, a signed bit of memorabilia cheaper than what um, Chopper was prepared to uh, let it go for. And anyway, he got thrown out by the security. Yeah. And he was hiding in the bushes out there. And he was a tradesman of some sort. And he had a claw hammer. And anyway, he was going to belt Chopper with it. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I stood in the way and he hit me in the chest. Yeah. That, yeah and that. dropped me down one knee. Yeah. yeah. Next one went over the shoulder, hit me in the shoulder. Um, that takes the wind out of you. Yeah. Uh, and then I knew the next one would be at the head. Yeah. Um, he'd had a few to drink. That's why he didn't get me in the head. And I've just grabbed hold of the leg of his jeans and pulled him off balance and sat on him and punched fuck out of him. Uh, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, look, I, I don't see that as an act of bravery, really. It was instinct yeah. um, and partial stupidity, to be honest with you, yeah. to jump in the way. But that's <laughs> what you do. I mean, I, if... I'd do the same thing again for uh, if I saw a lady in a car park getting going to get attacked. I'll always do that. Yeah. I hel I've helped police out on that many occasions. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Like mate, I've disarmed a, a Maori bloke who took a gun off a female copper at West End at that same pub. Oh, wow. I should have been given a bravery medal for that. Yeah. And they it went to court and everything. But you know what? They do not like it when they are disarmed and um, yeah. they won't even mention. All they said was um, sorry for getting you with the pepper spray instead of him. And, uh, Not the disarmed gun. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, I, I truly, honestly, I felt that I deserved more than a, a bloody thank you yeah. for that. Yeah. Because this bloke had already done 14 years jail for murder in Victoria and was in the back of the police car with them and he had disarmed her and was saying, I'm going to fucking shoot you. And I've jumped in and had his arm through here wow. and the gun pointing at the floor. And he was saying, I'm going to fucking shoot you. And I, I sort of shook it and it fell out onto the floor. And that's when they started pepper spraying. Yeah. And um, I, I truly believe that I deserve more than... Yeah, well, yeah. it that. sounds like you might have maybe, saved some people there. Maybe that was an act of bravery, that. Um, yeah. But there was a young lady, copper, and if my daughter or Mel's daughter was a copper and someone had disarmed them, well, I would hope that there'd be someone there to, to try help and, them. Try yeah. and help, yeah. So... And, and that's the thing today, right, with people, I feel like a lot of people wouldn't stop and do that. Like a lot of people, yeah. a lot of people just go, no, I'm living in my own world. I don't care about other people and just go past. Mm. Like it, it is, you see it every day. 
Well, yeah, you do, because it's a different society, yeah. um, you know, and the law these days, unfortunately, protects the criminals. Yeah. It does. Uh, um, like, yeah, it just, it's a strange, strange world we live in, the way yeah, things are. Very, it really is. Very even, even like, like, a, like a lot of juvenile crime that's happening around, hmm. like, where we live at the moment, they just get a slap on the wrist and then they're back out again, like, yeah. the next day, yeah. which isn't helping but no. that's a whole different thing no that's right um with uh chopper like obviously you you work with him and mm -hmm. um you had a lot of stories what was the like when you think of chopper what was the the day or the event that happened that you think of when you think of chopper like hmm um well probably um we we're over in perth and uh, he booked into a, a, a pretty nice hotel, like a, it was a sub penthouse type apartment. And he goes, oh, he'd arrived the day before, right? And I got, I flew there the next day. And he goes, that's your room over there, deputy. And I <laughs> thought, deputy? <laughs> anyway, I get in there and here's, I'm laid out on the bed for me, a set of um, teddy bear pajamas <laughs> and a deputy sheriff's badge and a cowboy hat, right? I thought, yeah, okay. And anyway, I walk back outside. He's gone and quickly got changed into his teddy bear pajamas, but he's got a sheriff's badge <laughs> and a big cowboy hat. I said, so it's, what are we, it's dress-ups tonight, is it? He goes, yes, go and get your uniform on, deputy. And anyway, I dressed up as the deputy sheriff and he'd rung room service. <laughs> The girl come walking up with the trolley and everything, and she's looked at me like, he's fucking sick. Or something like. And uh, anyway, um, she goes, where would you like the trolley? I said to Chop, I said, where do you want the food, Sheriff? He says, over there, deputy, like this. And she, this girl come in, it, it was just one of them things that was completely bloody strange. It, it, he, had a, he had a bad childhood, like he never had much of a childhood. And I think he was living out his childhood at some, when he yeah. did things like that. Yeah. But... You, you do other things too, like, mate, we're at the, okay, we had to go to Cairns one time, we were going to Weeper, and I, he'd given me a belt buckle which was roughly as round as that, yeah. yeah. and it looked like the end of a revolver gun, yeah, yeah. like with fake bullets in it. Anyway, Cairns, believe it or not, is an international airport, and the uh, security blokes have spotted it. Mm. And they said, you can't have that. And I said, it's just a belt buckle. Like, we're not letting you have that. Chopper kicked up a big stink. Next thing, I'm in the back room being strip searched. They stripped <laughs> me naked, searching. They thought well, I had a gun. Yeah. I, was, I had no gun there. But could, I admit that I rocked up with a bag full of machetes and uh, meat cleavers and tomahawks and axes signed, ready yeah. to sell at a show. Yeah, right? yeah. And they looked at that and they probably thought, what, what the, the, what the yeah. fuck is this bloke doing? Anyway, they strip searched me and they've got, they've sort of waved a wand thing at Chopper in the next room. Then he's come barging in. These blokes, I'm bent over a table <laughs> spreading my ass cheeks apart, right? And Chopper walks in and goes, you won't find a Glock up there. Like, <laughs> and uh, what are you doing to my bodyguard? You, and all this sort of stuff. And anyway, they, um, they said, well, we, we've let Mr. Dixon go now. You can get dressed, and, uh, but he's not having the belt buckle. And I'm thinking, that is fucking, how pathetic. Yeah. Anyway, I got to pick it up on the way back. And, but they put me on a plane with it back to Brisbane, though. <laughs> I thought, really strange, but you go to a, a, an airport with him and he's one of these blokes that liked attention. When his fame was sort of starting to fade a bit, um, he'd do things to gain more, more in the paper and whatnot. So you're at the Brisbane airport, you're standing outside the door there waiting for him. He goes, I'll just go into the toilet. And you hear all these laughter and carrying on and... He's sitting in there having a shit with the door open, just wearing, his, <laughs> just wearing his sunnies, and people are looking like this, and he's just sitting there with a blank look on his face with his sunnies on, having a shit, and there's people taking photos and everything, and the next thing you know, there's 200 people wanting to get in there. And he walks out, just strolls out like nothing's happened, and everyone's laughing and carrying on, and, uh, oh, mate, just things like it that. It sounds like he, wherever he was, he was just running the show. Well, no, when he was around in the presence of someone that was... 
uh, very capable of beating him up. Uh, <laughs> he w was very well mannered, wasn't he, Mel? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, and there was other times, you know, mate, I'm the last person on the face of the earth that's looked down the barrel of a loaded gun held by him and lived to tell the tale. Yeah. Like, he has shot at me in the past. Yeah. Um, and things like that. Um, <laughs> Long, long stories. Mm. And uh, some of the characters I met through him were, oh. they're very, like, um, uh, I can say his name, and, and a very, very bad criminal mate has shot police wow. and done some serious time. It was wow, yeah. And very serious criminal, yeah. right? And people like that, that you just don't have much to do with, mate. You meet yeah. them and you just, I don't want to go back there. When you meet people like that through mm. Chopper and stuff, yep. like what what do you like feel like? Do you get like an imposter syndrome? Like you know who this person is and mm. what they've done. Mm. What am I doing here? Like do no. you ever get that? Nah, mate. I, I was in complete control the whole yeah. time, mate. Yeah. yeah. When you... When you've got a, a reputation like Chopper Reed's, mm. right, had a serious reputation, most people are terrified. Yeah. When you're his bodyguard, your reputation, people are more scared of that. Yeah. Mm. Because you, what you, Chopper Reed's bodyguard, you must be able to handle yourself. Himself. Well, him yeah. himself is known for like, uh, like even the media, like 60 Minutes and stuff have said, mm. the man that doesn't need a bodyguard, has a bodyguard. You're the mm -hmm. bodyguard of the man that doesn't need a bodyguard. Mm, yes. Yeah. Um, the um, Believe me, he needs a bodyguard <laughs> um, because um, would you rate him as a fighter, Mel? <laughs> no, not really. No. <laughs> mate, no, he wasn't... Um, yeah. He, he wasn't that. He needed the bodyguard, mate. Mm. Believe me. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, when, you, when you get around and you're known as that, not many people actually want to have a go at you because they think well, shit, he's Chopper Reed's bodyguard. Yeah. There are plenty of people around could have bashed me while I was doing it. Yeah. They're, they're everywhere, mate. You know, but um, you just, you, you get that aura and people mm. don't do it. But yeah. when whenever I walked into a room with him and there was other people there, believe me, mate, I was in control. Yeah. Total control. Did, did that carry on to when you were by yourself and Chopper wasn't around? Did people see you in... Oh, what do you think, Mel? Probably a little bit. Yeah. A lot of blokes would say, oh, fuck, that was Chopper E's bodyguard. Yeah. You know? and, and that would definitely come to the poor. Yeah. But uh, not so much now, you know. Yeah. But, um, mm. yeah, mate, you, you had that bit of awe about you because of it. Yeah. Like, even even now, do you get, like, people that are, like, I don't know, afraid of you for, like, being associated with, the people that you're... I, 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 look, people are more fascinated by it mm, yeah. more than anything. Um, fear, um, I built up a bit of a reputation as a, a good debt collector and I can make phone calls and, and put the wind up certain people. Mm. Other people, mate, they just they just say, fuck you. Yeah, what are you going to do? I'm yeah. going to go to the coppers. Mm. And that's the, the way the law changed. But yeah. definitely when I was with him and I walked into a pub where we were going to do a show, yeah, there was sure enough two blokes there that would want to have a chop. Mm. Um, but, uh, mate, like I said, I could read the play pretty well and uh, I know how to get myself out of situations like that. Yeah. And um, But there's other times, too, where we've been in pubs, mate, he'd put his hand, Chopper put his hand and say, for 500, who wants to fight me bodyguard? <laughs> and um, luckily, none of them bloody did. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky for me, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, with, with, like, Chopper, obviously, he had a big reputation in, in all of Australia and yeah. he's had like you said, movies and mm -hmm. different news events and stuff. Do you reckon the media actually represented who Chopper was? Or did they, they spin it in like a way to get... They, they, they represented him in the way... He manipulated them in the way that yeah. he wanted to be because yeah. he wasn't nowhere near as bad as what you think. Yeah. He, he wasn't... He was more a generous person more than anything. Yeah. Okay. He, he really was. He, he, was a very, he, he could be a very, very kind person, Mark. Mm. Like, you've got Chopper Reed and Mark Reed. Yeah. You get, you take Chopper away from video cameras and the media and that, mm. he is just like a normal bloke, mate. Yeah. Honestly, once you get past that he's got no ears, <laughs> he, he is just like sitting here, just like us. Yeah. And um, he, he, he can be extremely charming and everything mm. like that. And unfortunately, um, he contracted hep C in prison from um, 
he tells everyone it's sharing razor blades, but it's not. It's from putting drugs in their arms yeah. and that. Um, and it developed into liver cancer and it killed him. Yeah. He was only 58, yeah. which is way too young. Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, but um, I, th I think he, in the end of his life, once he was done with jail, you've got to remember, he kept himself, he, he got released in 1998 and he kept himself self-employed and a roof over his head and never went back to jail for 1998 until 2012 yeah. or yeah. 13 when he died. So that it itself is quite an achievement. With, with his liver cancer, like when did, did, what, did he tell you that personally when he got that or? Um, yeah, uh, he actually got cirrhosis of the liver first up. It was about 2008 and he told me he's got cirrhosis of the liver so no more drinks. Mm. Um, so he started drinking red lemonade. <laughs> and um, anyway, it developed into cancer, then they cured it. Yeah. Right? Um, they put a laser into him and they blew up 28 little tumours on his oh, wow. yeah. liver, the pea-sized tumours they were. Right? Blew him up and got rid of it. He was cured. Mm. Anyway, he starts getting on the grog and he show, he goes, look, this is what I used to do in the jail. Brute 33 aftershave. I can uh, swallow that uh. and then fucking wash it down with a can of coke, roaring drunk within tw 20 seconds. <sighs> right? And it come back. Yeah. And they couldn't fix it. Yeah. So... Do you reckon it's definitely from that kind of stuff that he did in prison that brought it on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. yeah, he had hep C for years, mate. Yeah, years. yeah. But in the end, like in the last, like the documentary we filmed that oh, I haven't released to the public yet, yeah. um, goes for an hour and a half, was partially filmed in our gym down there at Sutton Street um, and all around the place. Um, he, he, you could see he was yellow. Mm. Yeah. One email you could see was yeah. yellow. I, I watched the um, interview that he did on 60, 60 Minutes, minutes yeah. and you could tell he yeah. was... But was... see, no, I won't go into that. that that's their story, yeah. but I can tell you that's a load of crap. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and um, anyway, he, that, he got upset with me in the end. We didn't speak yeah. towards the end because he was living up here. He, he told his wife, I'm never seeing you again. I'm going to die at Mark Dixon's place at Scarborough. Uh, anyway... I said to him, Mark, I said, I'm not capable of looking after you mm. as a palliative care patient. You're, you're dying, mate. I said, mm. your specialists are in Victoria, in Melbourne. Mm. I said, your wife and kid don't, haven't seen you much for 10 years. We've been out on the road. And, y you know, you should really go home mm. and be with them. He fucking blew up. He didn't like it. Anyway, he called me every name under the sun. Yeah. And uh, he said, he, he got on national television that morning when they filmed that 60 Minutes interview. <laughs> yeah. He was on the Today Show and he got on live national television and sacked me. So I've sacked me bodyguard Mark Dixon. He's an imbecile. Wow. But he was me bodyguard and on live television. And I was watching, I went, <laughs> I, said, oh, I rang him up. I said, yeah, very good. I said, was there any really need to do that? He said, no, well, you shouldn't have sent me home to die. I said, Mark, I did it for your own good. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he rung me about two weeks before he died. He said, mate, I owe you an apology. Yeah. He yeah. said, you did do the right thing. Yeah. He said, oh, I would have been dead a long time, like yeah. ages before. So it was hard, though. I Believe me, it was hard to kick him out. I didn't want to. But, mate, when you think, how's he? Well, I'm not a fucking doctor. Mm. Yeah. How am I going to look after exactly. him? Um, yeah. When, when, when he did pass away, how, how did you deal with that? Was it obviously it would have been a bit of a hit because he wasn't just your work mate, he was a No, I knew, he, I knew when he was gone, mate, the, yeah. the second he was gone, I knew. Um, I was at the gym down on Oxley Avenue yeah. and um, anyway, my phone, I got the first message, but I felt it in my heart straight off. I, I knew mm. that afternoon. And uh, anyway, I had that, like, I turned my phone off for a little bit and went down, sat outside on the brick fence outside. And uh, anyway, five minutes later, I went back inside, turned my phone on. There was like 1,300 text messages. Wow. The phone froze. Yeah. With, oh, sorry to hear and everything like that. The, the amount of media that mm. contacted me, I, I turned the phone off, did all the training and everything that night, went home. And uh, yeah, nothing really. I didn't really, I never shed a tear, believe yeah. me, because I was fully prepared for it. But, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I was more upset that um, he told his wife he didn't want me at his funeral, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, so... That, so, did, you weren't in at the funeral? No, did, no, yeah. I'm not. And the sad thing about it is, um, his grave 
doesn't have uh, a headstone. It's got a white stick like a cross and it's got rest in peace chopper. His wife hasn't even bothered to give him a wow. proper headstone or a plate or whatever they have. Wow. Yeah. And uh, anyway, these people contacted me. I think they were con artists. And they said, are you interested in contributing to a headstone for Mark? And I said, yes. Mm. And I said, but I want a written quote sent to me and I'll go halves with his wife in it. It was going to be about $3,000 mm -hmm. and I was going to put 1500 in. And um, she didn't want to borrow it. Yeah. And I said, unless I get a quote, guys, uh, I'm not doing anything. I said, because I sent her money to help her out when she needed it. Mm -hmm. And someone, she didn't get it. Someone fucking set up a fake account and fucking ripped it off. So no more money going. Yeah, that's fair enough. And, um, that's shit. Yeah. Eh? Anyway, but that it's sad to know that, like, the guy has only got that in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Um, while working with Chopper, like, did, what was the main thing that he taught taught you? Because obviously you're saying that you taught him a lot of stuff. Mm. What was the thing that you took away from working with Chopper and just being around? Um, public speaking. Public speaking. Be yeah. one of them. Yeah. Um, counter surveillance. <laughs> <laughs> um, mate. Uh, he prompted me to write books. I, the first book that ever came out about me was Ghost Written. I told a few stories and a bloke wrote it. Sold 15,000 copies. Yeah. Uh, second book, I haven't even released it to the public because I, I got the shits with greedy bloody distributors taking yeah. 65%. But I wrote that one myself and my partner, Kim, uh, put it together and it was published. Um, but just didn't release it. Uh, but it's a far better read than the first one. Okay. Uh, and... Um, he, he, he said, you should write a book. And he said, one day they'll make a movie about your life. Mm. And, uh, mate, I've had a contract, a movie contract from Hollywood um, for about five years, but uh, I don't know. They don't, and a big Hollywood producer, Scott Einbinder. Yeah. And I've a, a script writer who is, he, he, he's a little bit mad, but he's a great writer. Yeah. Um, he put together a great movie script and it was sent to America. And uh, anyway... That was the year 2016 he wrote that script um, and handed it to Scott Einbinder. I had a 20-page contract with seven signatory pages. I was going to get $200,000 US. Wow. Right? And um, anyway, um, 2017, a movie comes out, The Hitman's Bodyguard, mm. right? It's been... The whole idea has been changed around and doing so they wouldn't have to pay me anything. Oh. And they've said it in England, they've made different people thing, but... Same if, story. Mate, it's about a, a bodyguard who was a really good bodyguard and he lost his client um, yeah. in some way or another and, um, and then become someone that they just hired out every now and again, which is what was in this movie, and he's hired looking after a bloke who's going to trial. Yeah. It's a great movie. So oh. the trial would have been about Roger Rogerson. Yeah. And I was a hitman's bodyguard. Yeah. And yeah. to me, they stole the whole idea and I didn't get a fucking cent. Yeah, that's shit, hey. That's mm. Um with Chopper as well, he, he did a lot of art. Did yeah. he ever show you his art or ask you about his art and stuff like that? Mate, I've got plenty of his art. Yeah, his art yeah, his art's um, pretty cool. His artwork is based a lot it's very abstract. It looks like a kid has done it. Yeah. Right. He, he, all of the heads were like a mailbox, like Ned Kelly, because he yeah. couldn't paint a face, right? Yeah, okay. So he came up with the idea, I'd paint Ned Kelly's head, the, just the slot and everything, and very abstract. And believe me, people paid big money for yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And uh, that was how he made a lot of money. I've seen people pay, uh, I saw one bloke pay $25,000 for one of them oh. paintings. Yeah. And, uh, but the, the biggest scam was the, the axes, the signed axe, right? You'd go to Bunnings and buy a $20 axe. So, sign it with chrome pen. Mark Brandon, Chopper Reed, never plead guilty, right? I've seen people pay five grand for it. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Um, yeah. Before he passed, on the 60 minutes thing, which you said was a bit mm -hmm. 50, yep. 50 he admitted to the, the murders of the four, four people. Four people. Hmm. Um, did... Uh, did he ever tell you about these or did he ever pass on like information mm -hmm. to you and stuff about yep. the four people what De desmond costello mm -hmm. oh the names yeah i'll put them up on screen well there's only one on that list that he did yeah and that was sammy the turk yeah and that's the only one he ever did yeah and that's the truth yeah okay yeah. 
But why, why do you think he said said the that then? Just to no, because it made a good story for TV and it got his wife some money. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Fair enough. So, so Mel, Mel knows yeah. yeah. So Mel, like, um, you obviously met Chopper. What What was your thoughts on on Chopper? Like, what? Oh, look, everyone. <laughs> Chopper Reed, they, <laughs> yeah. they shit themselves, yeah. you know. But to me, he was a big pussy. <laughs> uh, and uh, worst case scenario, I would have knocked him out there and there. <laughs> yeah. But, mate, that, that was just the portrait of him yeah. because everyone was afraid of him and, and he took it to that extent to make sure that they were afraid of him. Yeah. And it was just, just the way he spoke that you thought, holy shit, this bloke is mad. Yeah. And, and that's how people... Interpreted it. Yeah. So no oh, shit, chop a read, no, nah, see ya, I'm he gone. He definitely skid into the skid of he's a crazy man, like stay away from him. Very, very intelligent man, mate, I'm telling you. Yeah, very he, intelligent. He wasn't man. dumb. Yeah. He, he had was an IQ of over hundred and forty. Wow. He he could have been the greatest solicitor this country's ever had. Yeah. Had he not fallen on the wrong side of the tracks, he would have made a great solicitor. Yeah. You see. I'm telling you, the man very, very intelligent man. And he just ended up on the wrong side of the tracks. Um, but he knew he was great psychological at psyching people out. He's, his look, when, when he was younger, he did have fairly broad shoulders, jet black hair and no ears, covered in scars and tattoos and had a reputation like those books. People automatically fear. Yeah. Mate, once your bluff has been called... <laughs> you can't do, yeah. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You've, you've got to back it up or yeah, go, yeah, exactly. go the other way. Yeah. One, one or the two. There was, no. a, there was an incident in Tasmania where a truck driver cut him off. Now, Chopper would do certain things and he'd wear certain things to create attention to himself, like, mate, wearing um, pink moccasins. And, uh, he had these glasses all the time. Glasses <laughs> on, slicking his hair back. Anyway, a truck driver cut him off in, in uh, Hobart and he got out of the car and there's, everyone was looking, and he had a notepad and a pen. And he walked up to the bloke, and the he, chopper said, you cut me off, I'd like an apology. And the bloke said, fuck off or something. <laughs> and then he realised it was Chopper Reed. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Chopper's got the, on the door was the driver's name and address to be. He said, don't worry, mate, I fucking home deliver. Like this, and went and hopped back in the car. That, that bloke shit himself with yeah. the police. But you know what, if he said to me, home deliver, yeah. I home deliver, I'd say, I'll fucking deliver now. Yeah. <laughs> Get out. You know? yeah. but, uh, that was one of the stories that intimidating people um, go into massage parlours and stand over. What, what sort of a bloke, how hard do you have to be to walk into a massage parlour and belt a woman yeah. and take her money? Yeah. Like, fair neck. I mean, that's an act of a pussy. Yeah. yeah really. But back then, he did it. Mm. Yeah. You know? Myself, I, I wouldn't do that. No. <laughs> I don't want the massage. <laughs> <laughs> so who are we talking about now? Roger, are we talking Roger, about Roger. Roger the Dodger Rogerson? Yeah. Well, part of uh, how the law works, that um, if a police officer makes that instant decision to shoot somebody, then he really does become judge, jury and executioner. They called him. Oh, I knew him as Roger. Yeah. Roger. So did Mel. Knew him as Roger. He... You, you guys you guys both met him? Friends with him? Well, I, was, I met him quite yeah. a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, look, mate, straight shooter. Yeah. And probably needed more of them. Yeah. And, uh, well, we, we had one up here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I haven't mentioned his name. We know he's a good bloke too. Yeah, and yeah. he's a good. He yeah. was a good copper. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, same as Roger. You know, don't, no shit. Yeah. Cop this. Yeah. And yeah. Mate, that was it. And like when we met him down there and had a beer with him, mate, good as gold. Yeah. Nice bloke. Yeah. That's well, how I found him. Yeah. Mate, the way look, if Roger was sitting in there, like I said before, sitting there or sitting where Mel is, he just looked like your average old grandfather, mate, that had lived his life, and you wouldn't be able to tell who he was. He didn't have mm. tattoos. He had ears. Yeah. He always wore, like, a business shirt and had glasses. He was a smart-looking man. He, yeah. He's a dapper gentleman, the what I call Like, his yeah. boots were always polished and, and stuff. You know, like, yeah. he took pride in his Clean appearance. Exactly. Yeah, and um, he had a couple of bad scars, real scars that weren't 
put there. That, that's another story altogether about Chopper's ones. But Roger actually did get stabbed in the back, and there was a big scar, an L-shaped scar, probably like that big. Yeah. Um, and he also had an injury where he was um, he was pulling down a shed for some bloke, um, similar to the shed out there, and. Um, it partially collapsed and a bit of the roofing iron fell oh. and landed oh. and cut his Achilles tendon, yeah. which explains his walk. If you've ever seen yeah, him walk, yeah. before he had that accident, he was a very proud walk like a soldier. Well, after he had that accident, once that's been cut, you, you, yeah. he sort of walked funny. Yeah. But, um, um, <laughs> but um, like Roger Rogerson is dead set. When you're his friend, he, he is a really nice guy. Fair income guy, he's got a sparkle in his eye. You know what I mean? You, you yeah. know you meet them yeah. people at this, his eyes sparkled at you, they dazzled you. And he was very, very charming. Um, he was an expert at shorthand, yeah. being a copper. He, he was a, a brilliant copper. And back in the day, look, everyone thinks, oh, fuck, Roger Rogers was just a corrupt copper and took money. Well, look, but when he joined the police as a cadet in 1958, and then was a copper by 1960, right? If he was very good, like I said, shorthand and that, and detectives notice it. So back then, there's no computers, nothing like that, and you had to get anywhere, you had to have informants mm -hmm. and mix with informants like Nettie Smith and people like mm -hmm. that. Now, that's how they got half of their jobs done, right? Yeah. But the detectives at the time that taught him, there was a couple of famous ones, uh, Ray Gunner Kelly, he, he was the Rogerson before Roger, and uh, Freddie Cray, and hard, both hard blokes that would shoot you. Um, and they give you a choice back then, right? You can either follow us and you want to be a detective, well, there's lurks and perks that go with that. At the time, was considered completely normal. Oh, there's a bit of cash in this. We yeah. whack it up, boys. I don't see anything wrong with that. Yeah. Mm. Or you can spend your fucking police career in a fucking patrol car directing traffic. Exactly. One or the other. Yeah. So Roger wants to be a detective. Roger followed them and he did what his mentors taught him. Yeah. It, it's not like he was fucking bad to the bone, yeah. corrupt. He Sure, he took money and whatnot. It, uh, it, 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 mate, a lot, of, a lot of them out yeah. there are a lot worse corrupt yeah. than him, mate. Yeah. And... Uh, but they, they take away the good things too. Like um, in the 70s, um, there was, um, he actually rescued two boys that were drowning at Bondi Beach. It was really rough weather and even the lifeguards wouldn't go in. And these two kids got swept off the rocks and they were out there. They were going to drown. Roger was there. Roger swam out and saved both of them. Yeah. Right. Bravery awards, mate. There's so many commendations and that sort of thing that they, the media now don't take into account. Yeah. Yeah. He, he is a genuine, brave man. Yeah. He, he'd never say that, yeah. but anyone that knows him knows he is a, he's a very brave man. Yeah. And um, I've got nothing but the utmost respect for him. Yeah. Uh, he taught me a lot, yeah. a hell of a lot, especially about, well, look, I'm not going to say what he, secrets he told me. I, I can't. Yeah. But I know plenty, yeah. right? And uh, the coppers can come and talk to me about it all they want. They won't get fucking jack from me, yeah. right? But um, he he taught me a lot, especially about um, how to be a, a, a very efficient debt collector. Yeah. And everyone thinks debt collecting, oh, you go around and flog someone up. And that, that mate, that's amateur fucking hour, <laughs> right? How to do it without even raising your voice. Just drive up and... No, no yeah. wait, mate, it's, it's all about making the person think that you're doing them a favour. Yeah. Right? And bluffing them. Mm. And, and he taught me a lot about how uh, counter-surveillance, about police, how they operate, and counter-surveillance and all sorts of things like that. Taught me plenty. But he did teach me to be a very, very efficient debt collector. Yeah. And, with, mate, without, I can walk into someone's place and sit down and be as relaxed as what I am now and talk and, and get make people pay their debt. Yeah. And, and you know what? They shake their hand and they think that you're your friend. You're, 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 I've done you a favour, haven't I? Yeah. Look, and they, and mate, he taught me all of that. Yeah. And uh, I tell you what, he, he was the, the people he introduced me to, like, look, I know Mick Gatto because of him. Mm. Um, Roberta Williams. Um, I've met that many hitmen and that down in Melbourne and stuff like that um, yeah. through him and his connections. The, the biggest 
the big um, crime bloke in Perth. Um, his name's John. I won't say his last name. Um, mate, I've had um, bo national bikey president sitting beside me yeah. um, at his book launch and and give me their card and say, if you ever have trouble with any of these groups, give me a call and I'll yeah. sort it out. They'll leave your pub immediately. Yeah, wow. um, I met um, uh, Alan Jones through him, yeah. um, the, the radio presenter. Um, mate, uh, Sharky Raymond, uh, Mel Spartium, I think. Um, I met him um, down there. Um, all sorts, all types of people, wealthy, wealthy people. Uh, John Singleton, all of them. Wow. And uh, he, he was really, really good to me. How, how did you actually get the original connection with Roger? Like, how did you meet him? Like, how... Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I, I always had a fascination with Roger ever since I watched the movie Blue Murder, yeah, the original Blue one, yeah. right? And I thought, this guy is something different, mm. you know? Um, I, I actually met him. There was a comedian on tour with me and Chopper at one stage um, called... Um, he's dead now. Um, oh, I can't even remember his name. But anyway... Yeah. Um, he was good mates with Roger, and uh, I said, listen, can you give Roger a call? I'd like to meet him and say hello to him. Yep. He said, I'll put you on the phone to him now. Anyway, straight off the bat, we hit it off from there. Yep. And uh, next thing I'm flying down to Sydney, uh, stayed at his house, um, his holiday house as well, um, and got on like a house on fire. And uh, next thing I know, I'm traveling around doing things with him. Yeah. So. What, what did your day to day, like working for him look like? like what did you get up to? Everything? <laughs> no, um, look, um, a lot of the time, it, you, you're only looking after them really while they're doing shows mm. and that. But the deck collecting stuff, we'd just, um, he'd just say, well, I need you at this place, fly down, uh, I'll pay for the hotel and then we'll go around and see these people and then we'll go out to dinner with Mick Gatto, that sort of thing. Yeah. And um, yeah, but. Um, but there, there was no sort of thing as a day-to-day -day routine mm -hmm. at all. With Chopper, there was, because you had to look after him. You had to make sure... If, look, I used to have to carry his father's ashes in a gold box with me everywhere I went. He insisted on it. Yeah. So he, he goes, how's Dad doing today? I said, yeah, he's on the bedside table with me, mate. He's yeah. all right. And uh, things like that. A totally different sort of aspect. Yeah. And um, But Roger Rogerson, I... Look, not a lot of people will say this, but I'm telling you right now, and I'm looking dead in the camera, he is an absolute gentleman, and I wish they would let him out this afternoon because I tell you what, he's welcome at my place any time he wants. Yeah, and I don't care what anyone says in this country about him. I know him on a personal level fairly bloody well, and I tell you what, he's welcome at my place, and I'm sure he'd be welcome here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, with that, so do you think the way the media have presented... Uh, uh, Roger is the complete opposite of. Yeah, well, yes. well, the media, if they represented him as a as a good copper, there would be no yeah, well, story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's only got to be yeah. a bad copper. Every oh shit, he's he's a bad yeah. boy. He's corrupt. Yeah. Everyone wants to watch. Uh, Mr. Rogerson has saved a lady's life, um, and he's cornered the bloke in the garage uh, that was going to kill her, um, and Rogerson's arrested him. Mm. You yeah. don't hear it, you don't yeah. see it. Even we, like I mentioned it to my parents and uh, I went to a yeah. party last night and I was and like, people oh. are afraid. Yeah, people they're like, are... holy crap. Yeah. No, afraid of what? Yeah. I don't know, but they're just like, they hear the name Rog Roger Rogerson, they're like, yeah. holy crap. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? I'm scared of him too, mate, because <laughs> I, he is, look, even though he wouldn't do it to me, he is a proven killer, mate. Yeah. He will kill you and open a beer, mate, and not lose a second sleep about it. Yeah. And that's the difference that with people. He, he, he is very, very capable of that. Would but you if you're his friend, no. Yeah. Would you say that he's like got a soldier mindset when the soldiers go out, kill these people, and then they just come home and they have to just block it off? It's home, work, completely different. Well, no, I think um, a lot of the blokes that went to war... Um, for us, um, come home and they have a lot of mental problems and, and they don't they right. train them up for the army and they don't switch them off. They yeah. didn't have a choice. Yeah. 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 Uh, but Roger, I think if you put Roger over there in Vietnam War or he World War Two, mate, he, he would have done it. He'd come home, mate, you know what? Yeah. He, he could have killed a thousand, mate, and it wouldn't... Yeah. It, to him, it would mean nothing, mate. It was a job. Yeah. 
and, it, and he and he was a genuine good because you hear that and you think maybe he has something wrong in his head that he doesn't have the empathy or something but it well genuinely i don't I, because he it's justified what he's it, it's not like he, he shot someone innocent yeah mm. He, 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 yeah, the, the, in the street, the, the, the the, yeah. yeah, like this shit that's going on today. Yeah. It. If they if they had him down in Sydney, Western Sydney now, all of those problems, they wouldn't have a lot of them problems, mate. Yeah. Roger, Roger would have shot him. Yeah, just shot him. Yeah. You know, they were never allowed to get that big, mate. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. You take, take a leader out and it's done. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's all over now. They've built it all up to where you can't <laughs> yeah. get to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's something that we don't, Ryan and I, we've never been involved in it, yeah. Yeah. but you hear about it constantly, the gangs coming up, mm. yeah. and it's it's become a thing now, that there's gangs all yeah. around Queensland and Melbourne yeah. and Sydney. But and the criminal gang, yeah. uh, criminal gangs, the big ones, not these street thugs you see yeah, around Brisbane, but yeah, yeah. a criminal organisation does not get anywhere as big as what they are without the help of corrupt police, I'm yeah. telling you now. Yeah. And that comes from not just Roger, mate, Assistant commissioners and everything have told me that. They yeah. do not get that big without the help of corrupt police. Because they need to have the law on their side to get anywhere, like uh, you would imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, it, it's, yeah, it gets a bit out of control down there though, but it, different times too from when Roger had the, Roger had that place under control. Yeah. 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 You know? the, the, the gangs have become a bit of a thing now. Even NRL players have tattoos of their yeah, gang. But, it's just, uh, mate, it's just, who need, look. Yeah. The tattoos. Like, <laughs> do you see any on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, mate. Like people get them. There's genuine reasons. Some people get them. Yeah. Like Mel's daughter's got one of her horse that died. Okay, yeah. yeah. things that mean something. Mate, I've got nothing on me completely. Yeah. And I don't. I, I, well, one, I don't know what uh, to put. What's but so important. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I don't need it to. A lot of get them to be tough. Yeah. Mate, the toughest people I know don't have tattoos. Yeah. yeah. Well, look at you two blokes. Yeah, mate, <laughs> we don't we don't need them. Like if, if I went out and got a tattoo, yeah. I think Mel and Bunger would be very disappointed in me. Yeah. yeah. Um, the only person that I thought that I would get a tattoo of is the grandmother that I never met, as she died just before I was born, and I was going to get one of her portrait on my shoulder, but I could cover it up. I think Mel and Bunger would approve of that. Yeah. But if I went and got something ridiculous like that, I think they'd be most disappointed yeah. in me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing about Roger was obviously his like, right-hand man. And he didn't have tattoos. He didn't have tattoos, exactly. No. People were afraid of him. Mm. Um, his right-hand man, <laughs> laptop's probably dead, uh, Nettie Smith. Nettie, yeah. Um, did you ever meet Nettie? No, I never, I never met Nettie. Yeah. But I know Graham Abbo Henry pretty well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's a, uh, Graham Abbo Henry's a, uh, a really nice bloke. He got the nickname Abbo because he had dark skin, mm. but he was all grew up until about the age of about uh, 62 or something, believing that he was Maltese. Uh -huh. And that's why he didn't mind the nickname Abbo, yeah. because he had dark skin. He found out only in the last couple of years that he is actual Aboriginal. <laughs> so if you call him Abbo now, he gets a shit. <laughs> so I, I just call him Graham when I'm talking yeah. to him. So, but uh, you know, I know Graham Abbo Henry pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. Uh, believe me, he's um, he's a quite a serious individual. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, but a real nice bloke. If you're his mate, he's a he's a fucking yeah. good bloke. Yeah. So and and as well with like. I don't know, there's rumours, obviously. Mm -hmm. the, the media creates rumours. People themselves that are scared and stuff create rumours. Yeah. There's this rumour of, like, the green light that he gave Nettie Smith or something. <laughs> what, what, yeah. what, what's your thoughts yeah, on, yeah. on, on, on well, that? Uh, yeah, of course. It's a, well, it's created by the media, yeah. that saying. And Roger used to say, I like the red light better. <laughs> but believe me, <laughs> old Nettie had the green light, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the, it is actually, um, it's a media thing that has been made up. They, yeah. It's not like oh, Roger saying, Nettie, I'm going to give you the green light to fucking go and rob the banks and then yeah. just give me a bit of the money. Yeah. Like, you got the green light. Not like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a media thing for papers and yeah. stuff yeah. like that. That's what Roger always used to say, mate. Oh, I like the red light better. <laughs> like this, you know, he has to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But... Um, did you did you have any like emotion? Well, you've kind of answered that friendship with Roger. Uh, oh yeah, mate, we're mate. very very good mates. Yeah. yeah, very good mates. But I can't ring up the jail and and talk to him um, because he's on limited phone. Well, I could ring up. Yeah. Right, and I could go and visit him. 
But I tell you right now, if I go and visit him, I'll be on the front page of the Sydney fucking paper, yeah. and I don't need that, it. That would but, um, be really annoying. Mate, um, he's got limited visits, his wife and his solicitor, and that, and I don't want to take up any of that sort of time. Mm. I think th there's been three, four people visit him. His wife, his solicitor, um, Jordan Ibrahim, and um, a bloke called um, Steve Farley, who owns pubs around Sydney. Mm. And um, they're about the only ones, but... Uh, he, uh, he has passed messages on to me uh, yeah. through Steve, um, and he said, uh, yeah, I, I could come down there and visit him if, if that. He said, but expect to be questioned by the media, and I don't want it. Yeah, yeah, that's fair um, and, uh, but And I could ring up there, but, mate, look, they listen to every bloody yeah. thing you say. Next, if I rung him, I, I, if I rung that jail now and wanted to talk to him, mm. I could do it. But I guarantee you I'll have the police looking at me for the next six months. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just don't want that. Yeah, no, I don't want it, mate. No. Yeah. Um, wh when was the last time you actually spoke to him? Like, to the, May 2014. I think it was May the 27th, 2014. That day at the gym was around yeah. there. Wow. Yeah, the yeah. day after. The day after, it was on the Monday. It, yeah, he, he was gone that day, after that day. Yeah. That, that must be hard to be like, obviously you had a friendship with him hmm. and he's obviously still there, but you can't talk to him. Yeah. It's, yeah. And, and it's not just the pressure of the jail and all that, it's the pressure of the media yeah. and the people that are going to... It made it went as far as I had to register my car in a different name because I would get pulled up every day. Wow. And they'd want to know, like, especially when Chopper was still alive, um, is... Where's Chopper? Uh, we're in a photo. Uh, um, you take him to a hospital, then the doctors turn up at your house. Oh, I didn't get a photo. Can oh, I get a photo? Oh, all this sort of stuff, yeah. all that sort of behaviour, and, and pulled up because associate of Roger Rogerson. Now, mate, I'll tell you how far this went. I was at a mate's 50th up at Mango Hill, and I drank half a bottle of scotch while I was there. I shouldn't have, and then drove. Half, see, scotch doesn't really affect me. Like, if red wine put me over the limit. Now, mm. I, I went to Macca's at Redcliffe because I lived right near it and I got pulled up coming out of the drive through out of the thing on the street down on Oxley Avenue. Anyway, they blocked off one of the things. It took them 10 minutes to get out of the car. Right? And I thought, hmm, something's going on. Yeah. We went down the window and they said, um, here you go, Mark. I said, yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, mate, I said, why have you stopped me and take so long to get out of the car? And they said, oh... Oh, it's your association and stuff like that. And I went, oh, okay. And uh, they said, can you blow on the bag? And I said, yeah. They, they, first they said, you had a drink? I said, yeah, fucking plenty. <laughs> and uh, I blew in the, in the thing. And um, then they walked off and sat in the car mm. for another 10 fucking minutes. Another police car turned up and blocked the other lane up. Oh, so you think And I'm you're thinking, I thought, what, what are they doing? Yeah. And uh, anyway, he comes back to the car. And I said, how do I go? And he said, oh, he came up Trump's mate, blue zero zero. He said, but go home. <laughs> okay. Anyway, and that's when I think they were stalling me there because someone broke into my unit and stole oh. a fucking hard drive out of the thing. Yeah. yeah. And I reckon they did it while they had me pulled up. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. And it's it interesting. Shows there's so much behind, mm. behind, like the back end of the police and stuff that uh, normal citizens would not know about. To this day, I don't know why they got in, but I knew the hard drive was gone and it had a whole lot of photos on it. Mm. It had photos on it of everyone that was in the gym that day yeah. when he was, when he was uh, they were after him. Um, and lots of photos of me and him posing with guns and stuff. Yeah. And they oh, I haven't seen it since. Yeah, wow. Wow. So, um, I, I don't know, mate. I really don't know about that one, but... Yeah, anyway, I, look, I had the time of my life when I was with him everywhere I went, yeah. met some great people. Yeah, that's it. So. Well, well, I'll do what the, the normal news do. If you could say something to Roger now, what would you say? And I'll leave it in for you. i tell you what, the same thing I said to <laughs> Channel 9. Hey, Roger, if you're going down for the big one, mate, life, why do one? You should have done 20, mate. <laughs> there you go. Um, but uh, as well, do you reckon Roger, I, I know you said that there's a lot of people and he knows a lot of stuff, he's got a lot of dirt, mm -hmm. do you reckon there's any chance he would get out? He could be out this afternoon, mate. Yeah? He could be out this afternoon, all he's got to do is open up his mouth, yeah. but I tell you what, he'd probably be dead in a week and so would his family. Yeah.
Yeah. So that's why he's in there. He's being a man about it. Yeah. He could be out, mate, I'm telling you. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get on to Roberta Williams then. Carl was always a quiet type person, um, to me anyway. A little bit more outgoing before he was shot. You're like, uh, you worked with her, yeah. and um, just how you got in, how you got into working with Roberta. Okay, uh, is it rolling? Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, we. It's, it's funny. Roger introduced me to her. <laughs> there you go. Um, Carl was in jail by then. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, he decided that. It was around the time that Underbelly was first come out, yeah. right? And uh, her name was well known, mm. right? Um, so Roger said, why don't we bring her on the show? Because Chopper was having a break for a little bit. And it was me and Roger and Roberta, yeah. right? And uh, anyway, naturally, I was a bodyguard yeah. as well and taught her. I, I actually taught her how to public speak. I had to sit down on a stage with her and with a microphone and, and say, oh, tell us about this time, Roberta, and everything, because she mm. couldn't get up and she didn't have that sort of confidence to get up and talk yeah. straight off the bat. She did after a while. Yeah. And uh, believe it or not, she was actually quite popular. A lot of people wanted to hear what she had to say and and what she was actually like as a person. Mm. Um, the media have given her a hard time too. Yeah. Um, she, she actually, when you get to know her, um, like I haven't spoken to her in years now, but um, she's had a very sad uh, childhood um, and um, she's seen her father actually burn to death in a oh, car accident oh, yeah. or truck accident. And, um, you know, she... I, I actually think she's done quite well bringing up all of her kids now and, and putting the roof over their head and everything and she's trying to do everything by the book. Now, yeah. obviously, she was with Carl Williams, who was a multi-millionaire from drugs and yeah. stuff like that, and she lived a lifestyle like that for a while. Um, and uh, she became a household name because of Underbelly. Yeah. Um, but, like, when you get to know her, you hang out in a big hotel room with her and stuff like that, um, she's actually quite a nice lady. Yeah. Um, you know, and um, she was only trying to earn her money to look after her kids. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, yeah, um, I, I had her up here in Queensland oh, half a dozen different occasions. Yeah. Um, nowhere near as much as what I looked after Roger or Chopper, but, yeah, um, looked after her a bit. But, I, I mean, yeah, it was only to look after her is more stop people bloody mobbing her. Yeah, she, yeah, okay. She, she um, was quite popular at yeah, the time, yeah. you know. Once Underbelly came out and... There's a lot of ladies actually wanted to meet her mm. and, and get an autograph. She would have, I've seen her do a thousand autographs in one night, yeah. you know, and uh, then we go back to the hotel room and um, all of it, me, her and Roger and go to sleep, have yeah. it do what normal people yeah. do. But um, I, I haven't got a bad word to say about Roberta. Yeah. Um, a lot of people do, and she does have a reputation. She's yeah. scary to some people. Yeah. To me, it was just, I used to call her um, Bert. Bert, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, just, mate, nice lady. So yeah. did, did you ever have any, uh, you said he was in jail, any conversations, any anything with Carl at all? Any, like, communication at all with him? No. no nothing? Just nothing? He did ask, he used to ask Roberta about yeah. it all, yeah. yeah. And she'd tell the stories and stuff yeah. like that and everything like that. And he was fascinated yeah. by it. Um, and uh, especially she was knocking about with Chopper Reed's bodyguard. He loved it. He was a big fan of Chopper. Yeah. And uh, he, he loved that fact. <laughs> yeah, and, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, unfortunately, he got bashed to death yeah. in jail. So, um, you know, um, Carl, I think, might have might have had a nasty streak in him. Mm. Um, but uh, he had a lot of power, mate. He a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, when you get like that, I suppose it all goes to your head and... Uh, it's got to come crashing down at some stage. Yeah. So, but um, if you if you were sitting here with, with Roberta and you you don't uh, ask her personal questions, um, I tell you, she's well, a very pleasant lady. Yep. Very pleasant lady. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, uh, well, we'll round it out. And yep. um, I was going to ask you a couple of questions, like yep. with Underbelly. Yeah. Did, with Underbelly, massive show. Did yep. you did you watch it? Enjoy it? Yeah, I loved um, it. Um, I think too much rooting, not enough shooting <laughs> uh, in it. Um, 
and uh, was very good entertainment. But what they do with those shows, um, especially the first one, is which I don't think is a good thing. At the time, I used to think it was a good thing, but now I don't. I think what they do is glamorise underworld hits. Yeah. That's why, if you notice in the media now, they don't call them underworld or gangland hits. They call them um, police incidents, someone's been shot yeah. or something like that, because what they actually did when they created those shows, they glamorised people fucking that shooting lifestyle. each other. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's not a glamorous thing at all. It's 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 horrible. Yeah. It's actually horrible. And... Uh, and for these people to actually go around shooting people, you you have to have a, a different sort of mentality to yeah. what we do. You know what I mean? Like, um, if like I don't own a gun, I don't I don't need one. If someone breaks into my house, I'll I'll just bash them. <laughs> it, um, um, the same thing had happened here. If someone walked in here, mate, mm. they get the shock of their life. Yeah. Uh, um, no, it's, yeah. It's, if someone unluckily tried to come in here, <laughs> that, I just want to... That would be funny. <laughs> well, look, I've often said it, mate. I'm, I'm thinking, oh, man. Yeah. Uh, but, mate, yeah, this... I mean, the house is, a, is his pride and yeah. jungle. And if they want to break into my jungle, well... Exactly. You break them. Yeah. But uh, yeah, as I said, like that underbelly thing is great entertainment, but yeah. it, it's far from reality. Yeah. You yeah. know, like Benji Vendiman, they make him out um, to be have this glamorous sort of lifestyle um, and everything. Mate, he, he was just, he's a killer, mate. Yeah. He, he doesn't you know, get paid to shoot people dead and everything like that. There's nothing glamorous about that. You have to be a cold-hearted sort of person to do that. How do, how do they get all the information for Underbelly? Did they actually... Um, well, they... It, it was a bloke, couple of blokes down in Melbourne, um, John Sylvester and Andrew Rule, they, they wrote the books first. They actually had a big hand in writing Chopper's books. Yeah. Right? Okay. They're great storytellers and uh, they work for a newspaper down there, The Age, and so they, their books always get published. So they wrote about 12 or 13 of those underbelly books. Mm. All of a sudden, someone has taken them, a look at those books and thought, we can make a television series about it. Mm. They made the first one, which was about, at the time, it was the current gangland war down there. It was about 30 people shot. Uh, Alphonse Gangitano, all of them, you know, and Gatto shot Benji Veneman and all of this. They made a good TV show. It was a huge hit yeah. in Australia. The second one comes along since the 70s about the bloody, um, the corruption in Griffith with the marijuana sales and the, it was about the mafia, which I thought was a way better show than the first one. Yeah. You know, and then they have the next one um, was about John Ibrahim. And the best one, I thought, was the one that was set in the 1920s and 30s about um, in Sydney, inner city Sydney, um, about, they, it was called The Razor. Um, it's about they, the sly grog operations and the um, prostitution rackets yeah. and stuff like that. I thought that was a brilliant show. But the first one, no, because yeah. they, they glamorised they glamorized things, you know, that weren't, they're not glamorous things. Well, even with Roger, he was in it, but he wasn't, like, in it. Like, he was... He was... He, they said that character was him. They made it out to be him, but they yeah. never named no, him. No, that's right, because yeah. he he would sue them. Yeah. 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 Um, like, he wasn't happy about that movie, uh, Blue Murder. Blue Murder, yeah. Um, the second one, I don't know his opinion on it. Mm. it was, the second one was good. It was set, like, when he's in jail and everything. And, yeah. Um, the whole bit... Um, and they actually rung me and asked me about mm. information about it. And uh, I said, yeah, I said, but um, I want you to put me in the, the like an actor playing me yeah. and the truth. And if you have a look, there is a bloke that represents me in there for about two <laughs> seconds. When they're, when they're arresting him and taking him out of his house, there's a bloke that looks exactly like me looking in the window of the car like that for it. about two <laughs> seconds. I thought, fuck yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, yeah, but that was a good show. But, yeah, um, yeah anyway, there's your answer to that, oh, the Underbelly. It's great entertainment, but it's not factual, all of it, no. Well, well thank you for all your stories. Like, no worries at all. And thank you, thank you, Mal, for letting us in your home and... Uh, and and showing us all these amazing... We could do another uh, oh. another episode on all this oh. stuff. We, we definitely well, like I said, mate, there's a, there's a story to every, every picture. Yeah. We'll, we'll, get a, we'll get a shot of everything in here and yeah, show, no, and show no. it off. And, and oh. You want me to send some photos from oh, here? Oh, definitely, we'll take anything. And thank you for your time. You're welcome. Right.
No drama. And we'll and we'll wrap up. Well, thank you for listening. And um, where, is the gym coming back anytime yeah, yeah, soon? Yeah, yeah, very shortly. We've actually laid a slab for uh, the new horse stable because what we're doing is relocating horses yeah. down there. And then taking I, I actually the have got a huge shed down there which I'd love to set the gym up in, but it's got too much gear in. I could turn mm. it into the best boxing gym in Australia. Yeah. I'd have a bar and everything. Else. <laughs> and um, we could hold into club fights in there easy. Yeah. Um, but we've we've got. My partner's got a, another, up where the horses is, we've got a nine by nine shed there. We're gonna put the boxing ring in and then a big lean to that's um, 13 meters by nine or something. Um, and yeah. then a shipping container where we can store stuff in and we'll get it back up and running again. Yeah, awesome. yeah. easy. Well, where can they find out information about that? So well, when we reopen it more. Mate, we've, we've, it we've actually for. got a site. Okay, okay. Uh, and Alicia does all their work for us. Easy. Well, go check that out uh, when they open back up and we'll, we'll let you go. Thank you for your time. Pleasure. 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 We're on Facebook. Yeah, we're on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. no worries. Right, thank you. Thank you.